All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the presentation of dynamic audio for video games and also an extra special edition, the talking about uh, live uh, recording orchestra and uh, Sonic 30th anniversary symphony. Uh, my name is Antonio Tioli, and I uh, will be the presenter alongside my dear friend, uh, Chota Nakama, and we will be talking about uh, these subjects for you. It's, it will be a, a great day. We are very happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Imagine, for putting this amazing event together and you know, being so cool to, to share uh, to everyone these great talkings and uh, you know share this knowledge about audio productions you know uh, audio for video games which is something that people sometimes forget about it and uh, and yeah so Chora you want to say something before we start <laughs> <laughs> just throw you in the fire I'm gonna turn you in the fire a couple of times <laughs> no. no well hello everybody my name is Jota Nakama um I always make jokes about my name for the Brazilians, for my dear Brazilians, because, you know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of, it's all very funny. Um, but yeah, so like, like Antonio said, we're going to talk about some uh, video game music, audio related stuff, including the uh, uh, live concert recording, well, live recording of orchestras and stuff like that. So yeah, hopefully you guys will enjoy. And uh, like he said, thank you so much for inviting us over here to uh, feature our talks. Awesome, great. So without further ado, I will share my screen here and we're gonna dive into it right now. So just give me one second. Let me just share my screen here. Let me just uh, make sure my uh, stuff is showing up here correctly. There we go. All right, okay, guys. So, uh, well, just a very quick introduction. Uh, as I said, my name is Antonio Tioli. I'm a composer and sound designer for uh, mostly video games, even though I have been working on other uh, productions right now. Uh, I have 18 years of experience starting doing this on 2002. Uh, so far, I've worked on uh, 400 plus games that, uh, you know, just uh, got, they got released. I am also the founder uh, of uh, Andromeda Sound, which is the audio company that I work, uh, Game Audio School and the Amazonic. Uh, just a very quick touch in here about uh, Andromeda Sound. We have worked in plenty of projects, uh, Game Changers, Domain, uh, uh, Sandbox, which, led by Chora, which Chora will talk more, uh, Marvel Future Revolution 30th Anniversary, which is a project from Soundtrack, Chora's, uh, Chora's company. And uh, we also, as I say, we created, we have a game auto school. Oh, let me just mute this. We have game auto school, which is a school focused on teaching uh, audio for video games. Uh, Hollywood Auto Summit, which is a summit that uh, brings people around the world to talk about audio production. Of course, it's not as big as Music Imagine. We're very small. We are on pause because of pandemic, but it's an uh, addition to the Brazilian community. And the Amazonic, which is our most passionate project, which is basically we travel to the Amazon and recorded hundreds of indigenous instruments. Uh, and now these instruments are available as a contact library. So it's a pretty cool project. And now I'm going to let Choda talk about uh, himself and his amazing, uh, amazing uh, audio company, Soundtrack. Choda, go on. <laughs> should, I, should I say Konnichiwa? <laughs> there you go, Konnichiwa. <laughs> there you go. Hey, um, so once again, my name is Shota Nakama and I write music, uh, compose, arrange, orchestrate. Um, I also direct recording sessions. I play guitar sometimes and uh, yeah, some keyboard and stuff as well. But yeah, like, so I don't know if I have 20 plus years of experience, but I, I do, I, I think I have uh, 20 year worth of experience, I would say. And uh, so, yeah, like I've been working in the music industry quite a long time now. And um, I, the the because of how I started my career, like I have more um, credits in the video game scene, but I have worked on like films, anime, TV shows, and with artists and all kinds of stuff, and through my company Soundtrack, and we have worked on like a bunch of AAA titles and um, like indie titles, like uh, Final Fantasy Fifteen, 
uh, Kingdom Hearts 2.5, Sonic Mania, uh, Real Legend, no, no Straight Rose, Lucky Tail, and all kinds of uh, modern games too, like, you know, um, like small indie games. Like we don't really choose uh, based on, choose what to work on based on the budget. We work, we work on what we want to work on. And also like we want to accomplish something. Uh, we want to make something sound great. So that's our motivation always. And uh, in addition to those soundtracks, we we do produce live shows. And my video game orchestra is one of them. And also we've recently worked with uh, Sega to produce Sonic the Hedgehog 30th year anniversary concert and 30th anniversary concert. And uh, also um, we we worked with Marvel to produce their the first ever online concert called Marvel Future Revolutions World Orchestra that came out last week and so if you haven't watched it please go and watch there we go awesome and i i bet uh these are kind of like shared clients that sean and i have worked for so marvel sega nintendo paladin studios Wooga, samsung by second life bandai nanko so it has been a great journey uh so that's why this presentation is going to be i i hope so super cool so let's talk about uh let's kick off here and talk about dynamic audio and uh and that's going to be the first half of the, the presentation then we're going to jump into the, the the live orchestra recordings um with choda so the focus here on this first section is to talk about um about interactive audio for video games right but before we jump into that we need to give a you know step back uh, and think about um, what is game audio, right? What what is the whole purpose of music in a video game, right? Because sometimes I see uh, people from even sometimes famous bands coming coming at me, and I know Chota go through the same thing. Like say, hey, I want to compose for video games. So how do I? Where do I start? And the first thing you, you realize is that the, the music for video games is, is something that you create not for yourself, you create for, for a purpose that is the storytelling of the video game, right? So this is our whole purpose here in this industry as a, as a game composer, which is basically enhance the storytelling of the, of the game. So if the game is a horror game and you have specific moments where people need to feel scared, needs to feel relaxed, needs to feel a specific type of tension, it is our duty to bring these feelings and sensations to people who are experiencing this game. So just like, you know, back in the world history where music used to be, you know, uh, used to tell stories, like to follow a storyteller. Uh, we're still doing the same thing on a video game. Uh, of course, there are plenty and plenty of ways to tell a story uh, through music, and that changes from composer to composer. We're not gonna be teaching and talking how to compose music on the technical side here, because that would be at least a day to start scratching the surface of this subject. But I just want to bring you guys this awareness that music for video games is um, something that is uh, very different than composing music for yourself or you know, for your band. Uh, and I like to say that music is the director's voice transmitted to the player through our musical notes. So basically the director tell us Shoda and I, hey, I want the player to feel this specific feeling here. On a movie, this is easy because basically you, you have the, the, the video synchronization and you know exactly which frame your music will change or will start playing or will stop playing or you know will play on that specific way of with this specific arrangement. But on the video game, this is a whole different situation because the players are unpredictable. So you don't know what the player will do. Uh, so you need to figure out ways to make the music work, uh, you know, in a dynamic way that will somehow still work as the director's voice telling the player what they, they, they should feel or not. Uh, and that's when interactive or slash dynamic audio comes in, right? Uh, 
when to, when we talk about game use with people who are not players, it's very common for them to connect the subject to bleeps and bloops and, and you know chip tunes. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, play the sound here on this from this video. Can you guys hear this? So if you notice here, this is a very, very simple example of uh, dynamic music, which we call a vertical, uh, re vertical reorchestration, where basically you have a separate layers, which are played by uh, bongos. And every time Mario hopping Yoshi's back, the bongos start playing. So this is very, 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 very simple. But of course, this game is considerably old and the technology at the time was more, much more limited, but still, uh, Nintendo was already ahead and thinking about bringing this uh, kind of like specific ex experience, which in this case, when Mario Hop and Yoshi's back, the bongos start playing and it kind of brings this wild vibe uh, to Mario. So So pretty cool, pretty cool. It's it's a it's, it's a oh well, this game is a masterpiece. But yeah. So uh, before we jump in into the examples and the technical sides of um, of interactive audio, I just want to fill you guys uh, in a, a little bit about the the inspiration and the and the stuff that we composers for video games take into consideration when we're composing for for games. Uh, and sometimes, like that, again, that's when composing for games and for your band gets completely different and separated because we have to take a lot of stuff into consideration. So the first thing, uh, at, at least for me, I don't know if Shota agree. Shota can definitely jump in and and, and 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 you know add up. But at least for me, my biggest thing is is the story. That's my biggest inspiration. So what's the story? about this game what are we tr trying to tell to to the to the players you know like uh, in, in terms of experience or, or storytelling to be more specific uh who is the character is the character like a you know a real human being is like a cartoon creation it's like from a different world it's a funny guy everything starts to feed us uh, in terms of ideas, because on the beginning, you just have this white and infinite canvas, which is bad because you don't know exactly where you can go. So the whole idea here starts is basically try to narrow down your possibilities and give you a more clear path about uh, wh what you can do. Also, what's the place and time? So is the game, does the game happen in Japan? Does it happen in Brazil? Does it happen in this uh, on space? You know, it's like a game from uh, the 16th century. It's a futurist game. All of these will start to influence your ideas. Uh, instrumentation. I think the instrumentation sometimes, actually most of the times, it is uh, the result of this equation here. So character, place and time and story. Right. So if it's a Japanese game that happens on the future, let's say like Evangelion, where you have Tokyo Tree, so that's a futuristic uh, game. The first thing is that oh, I'm gonna use like you know uh, synthesizers, some orchestra here, and then some Japanese instruments, and maybe I can try to process uh, these Japanese instruments to bring on a on a specific context. And, but then sometimes the director comes and say, yeah, but the story, even though it happens here, it's about this guy that flew that were, or transported from the past to the future. So we want to still connect to the past. So in this case, I will be more focused on in terms of instrumentation about the storytelling and the place and time, that kind of stuff. You, you have to find your balance. Um, also the color palette, something that is very important if the game is very colorful, 
at least for me, I tend to use way more instruments to bring a more colorful arrangement. If it's like a monochromatic or black and white game, I like to reduce the, the amount of instrumentations. Uh, dynamic as well is like Sonic, for example, is a game where you go super fast sometimes and sometimes you stop for exploration. So how, how will the music react to that? You know, uh, once again, direction is very important. Uh, one thing that I like to say is like when you're working on a gig with a new director, try to know what type of music the director likes to listen because these will definitely be connected sometimes. Most of the times with the result that he or she will be expecting from you. Uh, target audience, it's very important, is the game focused uh, on the young audience, it's focused on, you know, more adult people, etc., etc., etc. And the budget situation that will uh, let you know if we will allow you to record live instruments, etc., etc., etc. Every time I start a project, uh, I always try to have these uh, nine answers, nine questions answered. And then I start, I start to uh, get inspired by my, what I call my, my, my vision board. So I like to go on these four categories, the mood, the story, the character, and the dynamic. So if we use uh, Sonic Forces, for example, which is a, a, a beautiful game, you have this, the character, right? Sonic, who is Sonic, right? It's like a super fast character, positive energy, good vibes, uh, nice guy, always try to save their friends, which is connected to the story. And then you have Robotnik, that is the villain, rescuing the, the, enemies and the, the animals and transforming into robots. The dynamic that I just said, Sonic goes fast, goes low. And the mood and vibe of this, uh, especially this, uh, this, this level where you have this colorful and sunshine day, uh, in the forest uh, or Green Hill. And, uh, you know, so definitely all of these will inspire you to start creating the music. So once you start to have these answers, the next thing is definitely uh, thinking about uh, the, uh, how the music will behave in the game. Before I jump into that, Chora, would you like to say something about this? Or like, is your process a little bit different that you'd like to contribute or, or no? <laughs> no, it's pretty much the same. Um, I think it's it's really like like Antonio said, it's really about the story than anything. Yeah. And well, story and characters, of course. Yeah. But um, um, like our job, like like Antonio said in the very beginning, our job is to enhance the the gameplay and uh, story and everything that yeah, everything like that's there. And it's not just about music when you're working on multimedia, uh, interactive music or, or non-interactive music. Like it's, if you're working with any kind of pictures, it's really about the whole experience, right? And so like music has to tell us, help telling the story as well. Yes, that's our, that's our ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And... So with, with what Shota said, and as we said before, it's not just about the music in the end, but how the music will behave in the game. And, and that will be a big part of how the music helps uh, enhancing the story. And that's when the interactive audio kicks in, right? So I, I really have to say that it, it's not that it's like mandatory, like to know interact auto to work for video games, but it's definitely, uh, it's almost like a must. Uh, auto Kinetic, which is uh, the creator of WISE, which is one of the biggest uh, interactive auto tools in the game industry. They give this, they did this symposium uh, this, this week. And uh, I was watching this discussion with uh, very, very famous gaming composers like Austin Wintry from Journey, uh, could be the unir and anyways a lot of guys and they were like talking exactly about how is a pre on their perspective they use the word mandatory to work no interact audio uh, of course it depends on the client that you're going to work with so some clients sometimes they go like oh we don't want interact audio especially in brazil sometimes the, the projects are very small like mobile games they just want to play the music in loop and and, and sometimes like add or remove a layer or so, 
Uh, so it's not a big thing, but here in, in like US, Japan, Europe, it, 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 I, I gotta say big gigs always use like interactive audio. Uh, sometimes they have someone that will figure out in, uh, in-house, which means work inside the company. But knowing is definitely good because it won't restrict you in terms of business opportunity, right? So interactive audio is a great way to maintain the attention of the player, right? Because the music changes and adapts to the player's action. Uh, it brings a deeper immersion in the game by having the music following the player's actions and providing punctual and specific moods for specific moments. Uh, it's great because it avoids repetition. It enhances the storytelling and support narrative development and much more. So it's, it's almost to a point of like, Think of you watching a movie where the music is definitely not connected to what's happening in the story. So basically like think about you watching the movie Birds, right? Which doesn't have any background music. And then on your own, you play Metallica on the background. So that will give you a very different uh, experience from someone who is watching the movie without any music at all, which is how it was made. So. With the music, we can really make sure the player will feel what we want them to feel. Uh, so there are plenty of ways of working on uh, interactive audio. And what I'm going to do is basically show you guys uh, some videos with some examples about uh, these ways. And we're going to be talking a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much it. So the first one is vertical layering, which is the basic of the like, most basic way. Uh, it's an adaptive, adaptive technique where composers break up a music cue into two or more musical layers, just how we saw on Super Mario. Like you have the, the main music layer and then the bongo layer, which is turn it on once Mario hop into Yoshi's back. The layer can be exported by instrument family or musical function. It's up to you to decide, or it's up to the developers to, to direct, uh, orient you on that subject. Uh, usually a minimum of two layers are used being on one, oh, sorry, there's a type of here, one for exploration and another one for uh, battle uh, to add intensity. Uh, but of course it goes, the spectrum is way, uh, way wider than that. Uh, and these layers are activated and unmuted depending on the on the gameplay. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to play a video. It's like a two minutes video where I will show you a, a Fallout Vegas, uh, where the director uh, where, the, where the director comment about this a little bit. So here it goes. He will also be talking about uh, scripted events, uh, which is basically the trigger points where the music triggers. And uh, yeah, it uses more than just vertical, but this is a good example about it. So here the music is playing. Have the music fades because he leaves the area. So this is very interesting. So basically, uh, you know, in order for the music to change in the game, we need uh, to have the trigger points, like what will trigger this music change? And it, it changes from game to game. Uh, sometimes it's the location, sometimes it's the player clicking somewhere, sometimes it's a game event, like a battle that happens. Everything that can be considered uh, like a, an event in the game, that's where we have the trigger to change the music. And in this particular case, the composer decided to go with, uh, or the developer decided to go with the location place. So every time the, the player uh, gets closer to to the center of the of the town, the music starts playing. So that's how it works. So I'm gonna play it more for 30 seconds, then I'm gonna move on because of the time.
All right. So this is one example. Uh, I'm going to try to be super short here because of time, time wise, guys. Uh, this is F mod. This is uh, one of the biggest tools that we use to do that. And basically, uh, we have in the industry basically two auto softwares that are the main, the, the core auto softwares, basically F mod and WISE. So this is F mod. Uh, both are great tools, very different, but the result usually tends to be the same. So here you have uh, a very interesting uh, example where you have the layers, like layer one, layer two, layer three, up to layer six, where these layers are activated through code in the game. So whenever the player uh, you know, reach out to a location, basically what happens here, it, it, there is a, a fade curve that you can draw and this fade can be activated through code. So it's almost like if you're doing like a live mixing in your game, it's pretty interesting. I'm gonna show you guys some examples uh, more later about it. Uh, the other way of doing dynamic music is what we call horizontal resequencing, all right? So in this particular case, all the music cues change seamlessly from a piece to another, depending on the player actions and the player's decisions. It is very effective to uh, quickly change the mood of a music piece and create momentum. Uh, there are several types of horizontal resequencing, which I will be talking about it. The simplest uh, way is basically the uh, the crossfading. So I will play you guys uh, for you guys this video, and you will notice that uh, depending on the area that the player is, you know, flying around, the music will simply crossfade, like without any kind of attention to rhythm, harmony, or anything like that. The music just crossfades. So very simple way. Basically, a lot of cues that just cross fade depending on the areas or the events of the game. Um, the other way that we have to work on a horizontal uh, uh, resequencing is a phrase branching, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a much more interesting technique that waits for the current musical phrase to end before playing the musical cue. So on this one, composer needs to chop the musical pieces into very small chunks. So I'm going to play for you guys a very uh, classic game here uh, from LucasArts. And you will see, I'm not going to play everything, but uh, you'll see that uh, during the dialogue, the music just uh, changes. And when the dialogue is, is, is over, the music just wraps up like with a very cool ending. So. Where do you think you're going, fancy pants? You ain't from these parts, are you? This is a toll bridge. You gotta pay. I don't pay for nothing. I'm a pirate. Tough guy, huh? <laughs> Help! Police! <laughs> Scream as loud as you want. There's no police on Scab Island. Please, not in my new coat. Maybe I should cut you one out of cement. Whoa. Hey, you're loaded. This is my lucky night. Remember, wherever you go, on sea or on land, you can't ever hide from Lago Ligre. Tough town. I guess I should have got those traveler's checks. See, the music just ends 
be, uh, once the event ends. So there is this ending. So this is a very, very cool technique because it really feels like the music is directly following um, your actions. Uh, so another one is musical demarcation. It's very similar to phrase branching, but in this case, the cues are switched at specific points such as beat, a measure, measure, a bar, etc. cetera. Uh, on this one, composers usually avoid changing BPM of the music since it can create weird situations during the transitions. But uh, this one is from Killer Instinct, and I believe it was composed by uh, Mick Gordon, the composer that uh, did uh, the Doom. So uh, you will see how the music really follows the, the battles action and, uh, and chains all the time. So I'm going to uh, start the battle here. There we go. So there's no sound, there's no sound effects, okay, it's just the music. So battle is started, then the music starts. Like You also have this effect that happens from time to time. Which I'm going to be talking about it. See, all of these changes happens all the time in the same beat. And then the special. See, like, so basically, you know, the music changes completely, but it's still in the same beat, the same field, and uh, the specials from each character, have, they have different lengths. So the music needs to be chopped in very, very, very small chunks. So, uh, you know, you can end this music moment uh, depending on the, the different lengths for, from, dif from different characters. So that's the musical demarcation, and all the time this is changing in, in key, uh, uh, on beat, on a measure, on a or on a bar. Uh, the bridge transitions, which is very similar to musical demarcation, but in this case, uh, short music cues are used to connect one music cue after another. Uh, the transitions are all seamless, and uh, on this one again, the composer needs to chop the music piece in, in uh, very small chunks as well. So I'm going to show you guys a video from Dark Siders. Uh, let me just so you see how the music changes depending on what happened. So this is the same music. There we go, new scans. New scan just changed because it changed in the in the game. New scan just changed again. That's another track. So it keeps changing all the time. That's that's how it works. See here, the music just is just gone, and then we'll start playing again. So this is another example, which is called bridge transitions. 
Uh, the last one that I like to talk about is stingers and embellishments. Uh, stingers and embellishments is one of my favorites, to be honest. Basically, very small pieces of music are played uh, based entirely on the game events uh, and usually triggered by the player. So, example, when you find a valuable item or you discover a new location or you resolve a puzzle or you win a fight, that's when the singers play. So it is perfect to reward the players and it offers a great support to gameplay mechanics. And uh, it's one of the most common ways of interactive audio, uh, especially for open world. Uh, I have uh, an example here on, on a game called Uncharted. Uh, and uh, where every time Drake, the main character, uh, interact with some Look object in the game, basically uh, wow, you notice a office? very short music just plays. So here it goes. Sam, check it out. It's Avery's ship. First one. <laughs> the fancy. Yeah, attacking the guns away. That's how it all started. And that's it. Very short, like five notes. You interact again. Avery and two holding court over their captains. Looks like they're writing their code of conduct. Pirate Bill of Rights. Look, Pirate Captain Sigils, all gathered around Avery. Nathan, this is this is the story. So this is super cool because it it's it's extremely rewarded re rewarding for the player. Honestly, like you did the action, then the music, you know, plays something. Uh, it plays some music for you, and it just go like, oh, I found something. It's it's very cool. Uh, I will show you guys this very quickly here. And then we're going to wrap up and jump into uh, the orchestra recordings and talk a little, a little bit about Sonic and other, other stuff as well. But uh, this is F mod, if you never saw uh, before. Um, so basically, let me just uh, zoom out here. You can see here uh, where I'm not going to go completely into, into details. I'm just going to give you guys a very, very, very resume and quick overview. But basically, you have the transition conditions here that you, it's basically like, why uh, would this section of this music that says too low transition to this one here? And so on and on and on. And how we would transit. And in this particular case, we are using every bar. So if I play here, the music for you guys, and by the way, this music is not mine, okay? If I play this. And then I change the, and then I change the intensity here to one. Look what happened. Music just changed. Now let's say the intensity is different. That always getting more intense. And I change it too. And this will look here as, as, as long as I want. Now I'm going to change to number three. Oh, there should be an Andy. Sorry, there should be an Andy here. My bad. I failed on that, but it's okay. And then usually you have like an ending section of the music. Now, one thing that is very cool on, on, uh, on F mod is that you can create these uh, transitions here. So basically uh, the reason why the transitions from one section to another is very smooth. It's because basically we crossfade the music piece into, and in this particular case, I decided to crossfade it in two bars, right? And then you add a transition sound in this particular case, while the music is crossfading, it always it also plays this. So what happens because this is basically a new element in the music, it just brings your attention to that sound while in the background the crossfade is happen, happening and you're not even realizing. So usually that's a very a very tricky thing that we do to full uh, in a good way full the, the players ears you know or like this one here another transition if you remove that all you're gonna hear is the crossfading which is it's it works but it's not ideal uh so yeah so this is how we work on the horizontal resequencing on f mod and of course you can add more layers 
And uh, you can also do the vertical, combine the vertical with the horizontal resequencing as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a pretty cool uh, uh, tool. It's very commonly used. It's free to download if you guys want to try it out. It's fmod.com. And uh, the last one is basically runtime processing, which is a group of pre-programmed effects that are activated according to what happens in the game. For example, when the player goes under the water, you go and you put a, like a, a low, low pass filter or, or when the player is stunned, you add delaying cores and flangers, which you can do everything on FMOD as well. Or when like a, a bomb explodes close to the player on a battlefield and you know every, all the sounds gets muffled, you, you put a low pass filter as well. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, just to summarize and wrap up the section of the presentation, vertical layering music needs to be exported in layers stems so it can be added and removed in the game. Horizontal resequencing music needs to be exported into multiple chunks, uh, depending on the variation of the horizontal resequencing as well. The length changes, the length of the music user exported changes. Singers and embellishments are short music musical cues ideas that are triggered by events in the game. And runtime processing, uh, basically effects and filters are applied on, in real time in the, uh, into the music depending on the gameplay. So the, the, the important thing is like when you're working on game audio, the, you are working very close to the team because the, the coders needs to, the developers, the engineers need to allow you to go with this, to do this kind of like ideas or experimentation. So you work very closely, uh, you know, to the team and, uh, and that's how it works. Uh, let's jump out there, right, Kachota. Are you ready, my friend? Yes, um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was orchestrating for this urgent gig. <laughs> oh my God. Sometimes All right. we have to do that, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, Chota, I'm gonna let you comfortable to talk about uh, not, not, uh, I mean, not just Sonic, because uh, just so people know, there are very little stuff that uh, Chota can share about it for because of you no know, obvious reasons. <laughs> so, uh, but Chota will be talking about the all other projects as well. And uh, the whole idea, I believe, is like to enlighten you guys about you know orchestra recording and uh, and uh, the challenge of it. I don't know if everyone had a chance that people who are watching this had a chance to record live orchestra or not. Uh, I worked with Chota. Uh, on Sonic and some other projects. And it was a great, great learning uh, process for me. It was uh, awesome. I've learned so much from him. And uh, yeah, Choda, just share a little bit of your magic to us, man. So <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> a little bit of my magic? <laughs> <laughs> just preview a little. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we so we worked on the Sonic 30th anniversary concert so we call it sonic symphony and it's available on youtube so uh, if there's somebody who can post a link that'd be awesome somewhere uh we just hit the two million views and it's a huge accomplishment for us and uh it um it took a lot of effort to you know like make it happen and like work together to produce something great but it, it happened and and the result was incredible and uh, we worked side by side with, oh, there you go. Yeah. So you can, you can watch it. It's archived on, on YouTube and you can watch it anytime. And uh, yeah, it looks like we're almost at 22.1. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So you see like a lot of orchestra stuff and uh, it, it looks fantastic. And we, uh, we worked together with Sega side by side to, to produce this. And uh, we were, I was in charge of basically like directing the entire musical part and then produce some a bunch of things as well. So yeah, like it was, um, it was a long journey. Like it was very long and we traveled like Sonic, just like, you know, he was doing in the game. Just, you just saw. Yeah. And uh, we can talk about the, some of the workflow and also uh, like the teamwork collaboration and um uh, I don't know if, if we can share any behind the scenes stories, but like I'll, I'll, I'll speak some. Um, no, you don't have to do it. You can just keep it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I worked with Sega um, in the past uh, quite a few times. The first time we worked together with was, um, uh, when was it? Like it, I think it was uh, 
it was a show in Tokyo. So like my group video game orchestra, we played in Tokyo back in 2017. And uh, then we we had a conversation with Sega and we we asked them, hey, can we play uh, a few pieces of yours? And they they were kind enough. They were generous enough to like tell us, sure, why not? So we performed some pieces from uh, from from the game and we did rock band plus orchestra. And so that was the first collaboration. And then second time was in 2018. We were asked to do like a mini concert in a, um, San Diego Comic Con to kind of like just like celebrate the franchise and just like, you know, showcase some cool stuff about Sonic, which we did. And uh, they, they loved it. And then like that led to another and eventually like when when the when the sonic's 30th anniversary came in they were like hey uh why don't we work together and uh, let's produce something great so i of course i said yes and uh it it just was um it was a great journey it was a fantastic experience and uh the workflow was so like we received we we collectively decided what songs we want to feature and because it's it's an anniversary we decide to go to the this medley path so like from each game we feature like a bunch of um uh popular songs and uh we created like you know like demo rough medleys and then like we went to orchestrate slash arranging and antonio had a, a big role in there too and um yeah and once we had good good amount then we sent them over to Sega and the composers to check them out. And they were like, okay, this is great. And once they approved, then like we went to the copies to produce the parts and uh, prepare for the, to prepare for the recording sessions. And so the rest of the flow was kind of similar to uh, what you would do for any orchestra recording sessions. And, but like for this time we had the video to produce. So like we had to like definitely consider about like how we shoot the video and stuff. But yeah, like um, I, I definitely want to like just stick to the, the, the music topic for, for this one. But yeah, like, so look, yeah. If you look at that, like everything has to be in sync. So um, we, we had to prepare all the click tracks and backing track and everything to make sure that like everybody understands uh, what, um what the musical intention was for each piece each arrangement and also like what they are supposed to do and i also sent the video team a note a huge note explaining like what's happening when and where and which instrument so yeah that's that's how we produced the whole thing and uh, sega did all the game scene capturing and we we mixed everything together and, and, I, and I just think, I just think, Chira, of course, and I'm, I'm not going to enter in any details, but I just, I just like to um, let highlight the importance of how it is for you to, to become a, a trust, a trustable partner, right? It's like something you develop. It's not like out of the blue that happens, you know, it takes time and and, and yeah. I know, like, when, when I was in Brazil, not even going to talk about Sonic now, so we can make this more generic. But when I was, while I was living in Brazil, before I moved here to Los Angeles, I, I was always questioning myself, like, how, how do you get to work on, on big gigs like that, you know? And uh, what I've learned when I moved here is that, if, you know, making, uh, putting yourself out, making solid and real connections with people, that's and of course on top of that you have to be talented and you have to deliver stuff on time with the ultimate quality so if you have all of this that then things start to happen but it's so important to become this you know partnerships like shoda and i uh again to make it more generic and not go anymore on, on directly to sonic <laughs> because we don't want that when i even change the slide here so Shoda and I, we know each other for six years now, and uh, we became friends. And it's been six years. Yeah, it wasn't fifteen, man. What? <laughs> what the hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> six years, bro. Wow. So, and, and then like we became friends, and then Shoda fly to my house, and of course, like 
I was a fan of Chora's work on, on, on visual. And uh, for me, I was like in awe, but Chora and we became legit, legitimately great friends. And then we played together in Brazil on, on the on big festival. And then we, when he comes here, he, he, he stays in my, my house and sometimes, and, and you know, like, so became a friend. And because Chora know how I work, uh, he invites me for some projects like Sonic was one of these conditions, one of these cases. He knows my work, he knows I deliver. And it's the same thing with Chora. Like whenever I, I, I have a, a cool project that I think, oh my God, Chora needs to be here because I know Chora will deliver. He's like an extremely hard worker guy and we love each other as friends as well. Like everything, uh, the, the partnership is, is, is always uh, natural. So it's very important, right, Chora, to nurture these things with clients and, and people, right? Yeah, in the end, it really, it's the, it's the trust, right? It's and whether trust. you can deliver or not. And if you, yeah, you, you just treat all the clients uh, professionally and with respect. And that's that's really it. Because it's just like any friendship, right? Like if you have a friend who never, who, who respects you, who always does things for you whenever you ask him to do like not taking advantage or anything but you know like giving favor to each other and like somebody if this person keeps a, a, a promise always then like naturally there's more trust so exactly. it's the same thing you have to you have to build the trust yes and i uh we should uh I think that on, on the overall now we, we can we're not talking about Sonic anymore. I want, to, <laughs> I want to be clear. I want to be it's very like, specific. I, I, just, I just love the fact that you say that so many times. I have to just to make it official. So but for those who don't know, Chota record orchestra like on, on, on this past months that I've been working on on Chota's other projects as well. Chota recorded for other uh, orchestra, uh, recorded a lot of orchestra for other projects and. Dude, just if you can talk a little bit about the challenges that we don't mention any project specific, but about recording remotely, you know, mm -hmm. like it's very, it's a, it's a very difficult right uh, way of doing the, the production, right? Like, yeah, it's it's interesting, and also um, before COVID, like I used to fly to all those sessions, and Antonio and I went to Bulgaria to, you know work together on Jason Becker's session and stuff. But like now, obviously we can't really do that easily. And uh, you have to monitor everything online remotely and through certain softwares like Source Live or Listen To by Audio Mover. And uh, it gets, it, it, there, there are certain hurdles you have to overcome. So in person, it's just, it's a lot easier for you to tell people what to do and like, also, the message gets across so fast, but online it's not the same. And so, like, if you want to change certain things, if you want them to play in certain ways, you have to write a little bit more in, onto your scores, and also you have to be able to like pre-indicate that. Like, you have to make sure that like you write down a lot of notes beforehand so that everything goes smoothly, and also they they can uh, play and follow your intention. And so, yeah, th that kind of stuff. And also the, the time differences, that's a, that's a big factor. Oh so, goodness. yeah. So if, um, if you're working with an orchestra in Bulgaria, they, they are, for, for me, they're six hours ahead. Nine hours for me. Yeah, nine hours for him. And also, if you have a client in Japan, and uh, it's completely different too, right? So you you do have to well, somebody has to suffer, <laughs> and uh, you you do have to kind of like go with the whenever the client feels comfortable with. So you know you kind of have to adjust your your sleeping cycle so that like you are energetic, you can actually last. For the duration of the sessions because sometimes sessions can be like eight hours long with the breaks and stuff and you have to stay up for the entire time so yeah like stuff like that like you do have to like plan things a lot more whereas if you are doing it in person then you are there you're energetic you you stay up because your body is adjusted to the local time but yeah like it's um there, there are a lot of like non-musical challenges as well and also you you do have to have a good listening environment 
and you have to make sure that like the internet is fast enough on the production's end so that it doesn't like cut it doesn't cut out like sometimes if the signal is too weak then like it just like chops and you you can't give enough feedback but yes yeah, yeah there there's just so many things and, and but yeah like when you do it right and it's it's great it's conv- it's very convenient and also if you work with a production that's like really really great and you you don't really have to like give feedback as much as you know other other productions so yeah finding the right people to work with right contractors right engineers to work with is is very 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 crucial for the remote recording and, and choda like uh, i like to ask talk about that because like for those who don't know choda has a video game orchestra which is fantastic um what's what are the difference uh, there are some questions here uh people are asking we will we will answer you guys in a second after this question that i'm going to make to choda and then uh, we can dive in uh, into that those questions but for those who don't know choda has a video game orchestra which is amazing and what are the difference choda, in, in your opinion to like orchestrate for a, a, a full piece orchestra and, mm-hmm. and then a full piece orchestra plus band like a What are your concerns? What are things that you try to avoid on the overall board? Like, yeah, think- so um, having a band is very different. Also, having a having a vocalist as another complexity, and also like we actually do have a choir for this one. Like you can't see it in the video, but like we we did have a choir for this. So it it's a lot more complicated, and also like the live concerts are just different from the production stuff because like. You do it in one shot and that's it. <laughs> there's no turning back. There's no layering. There's no like section splitting. And so you kind of have to like make sure that like they, everything just works well together. And yes, like, of course you have to, like even in production, you do have to write that way. Um, you still should. But um, if you are, say like you're recording strings, uh, woodwinds, brass separately, there's a flexibility to work in the post when uh, you can fix things, you can edit things more, more easily. And, uh, but like in this case, like for live shows, you can't. And also for the, with the band, um, there are a lot of the, uh, the way the sound projects for the band and also the, uh, the orchestra, they're, they're very different, very, very different. And a, and a good example is a guitar player. Like if we hit a string or strings, then it's like one shot deal, right? Like once you hit the note, then it decays only, right? But the strings, they can grow the sound because they, they use a bow. So you, you, you do have to like really consider these things. Otherwise, like it just sounds like really unnatural. It's just weird. And there are certain doublings that don't work. Like, you know, let's say like you in the ensemble, you have like two cello players. And then like the one thing you should never do is to double the guitar line. It, it sounds so muddy and it's just not, it's not going to be well. And so like you kind of have to reserve a certain frequency for the band. And it, you want to keep the, that frequency range a little bit simpler so that like a band has room to kind of move around and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, for the, for the band people, you don't want to write everything very specifically and you want to keep, you want to give them freedom. That's, that's how they, that's how they play. That's how they play well as well. So yeah, like there are, there are things like to consider. And I would say like, it's more like a musical culture. It's a cultural difference between the symphonic musicians the band musicians, choir and singers, and you do have to understand those things in order to write well. Yeah, it's amazing, man. It's a, <laughs> this for, for, the, for people who don't know, this was playing in Brazil. This was Brazil gaming show in 2019. Mm-hmm. And you were playing endless possibilities here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go, man. It's awesome. Amazing. I, I, yeah, I, see, see I, I said, I told you, sometimes I play guitar. <laughs> sometimes i'm on stage <laughs> you are a freaking great guitar player man that's come on so uh we have some questions here we have questions about um the dynamic audio uh and we have questions about the orchestra 
So I'm going to let Shota brief a little bit because he just so said, and uh, I'm going to answer the past questions very quickly about the interactive audio. And then I'm going to start saying, uh, ask you questions people are asking about uh, orchestration. All right, Shota? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, let me just see here. I'm going to uh, call Syria. Okay, people are asking about uh, in terms of like music theory. I'm trying to translate in real time because things are in Portuguese here. Uh, Wait, like that, they're posted on the, the Zoom comment? On the right? chat. On yeah, the chat. and uh, okay, I see. I there, see. Yeah, there's some stuff that are in, port, in Portuguese. So, it's, so basically people are asking about like what kind of music theory are usually taking into consideration when we're working on different emotions for the music? And I mean, that's like a very difficult question because like we pretty much use everything that we know. And sometimes things that we don't know, but we sometimes we need to, uh, we want to achieve a particular type of sound, like um, on, on, on Good Job, for example, that was a game developed by Paladin Studios and Nintendo. There was a particular group of tracks that I really wanted to add a bossa nova feeling. And even though I love Tom Jobim, it's my favorite composer, I'm not a natural in composing bossa nova. So I had to study the chord progressions, the type of harmonizations, the type of like how the melody behave and work with the harmony uh, on top of that. So you really have to be on top of the game re regarding music theory. Um, uh, any idea about how to start composing for games inside Brazil, uh, on Brazil? Uh, yes, just usually, uh, you know, connections and uh, going to like events like uh, Big Festival, which is an amazing event that happened every year in Brazil. It's the best way of doing. I also like participating on uh, groups on Facebook, et cetera. I think it's the best way. There's also uh, a global game jam, which allows you to work on games developed by people you never saw in your life around the globe. So it's a great experience of doing that. Uh, we want, uh, we want, uh, th this material is not gonna be available for now, especially because uh, for those who don't know, uh, Game Auto School, my school, gameautoschool.com, we are working on an interactive audio course right now that will be available very soon for people. So you guys will learn way more than, than what we talked here uh, on, on Game Auto School. So if you want to be you know, aware of it, just go to gameautoschool.com and, and put your email there. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going from top to down and then we'll start asking the question about the orchestra. So uh, like in case of Doom, the stems should be exported with the limiter and the masters uh, so we can provide this vibe that the music is heavily processed. They ever, all the heavily processing in the tracks are made before going to, into F-Mod, but then the, the, there is always a chance of stuff being compressed and, and limited uh, you know, in, in real time uh, in the game, which usually that's what happens. Um, okay, Chora. Now we have questions about uh, about the orchestra. So, yeah. uh, could you go a bit into how you arrange the orchestra? Oh, yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, this is you gotta just start doing it because <laughs> that's what I did. Just go for and, it, right? Because. You know, like it's just impossible to know these things because I don't think anybody teaches. I've I've never seen any um, good texts or textbooks or articles about um, orchest specific orchestration for rock band and uh, orchestra. Like you can't find it, so you kind of have to experiment and just figure out how, what sounds good and what doesn't. But um, um the chord voicing and stuff I, I think like like i said before you should stay away from the the certain frequency range and and don't write as much and you you can write simple stuff uh for the orchestra you, you don't you should not feel guilty and uh not ev you don't have to write everything so complicated things can be simple and in fact, a lot of times, uh, if you write simpler, it sounds better with the band. And unless you like, you really know what you're doing. Uh, just I, I would 
I would recommend start simple with the orchestra. Just like do some pads with the strings and uh, woodwind runs and stuff and just kind of experiment and then like see like where you can go and find your tone. And yeah, you just have to start it somewhere. And I did I did listen to a lot of SNM by uh, Metallica. And also oh, like the best. Yes, Michael came in. Yes, he's best. great. And uh, a lot of it came naturally to me because I've, I've always been into the, uh, I wouldn't say neoclassical metal, but like symphonic metal from, uh, from Europe. Like the, the good old stuff from like late 80s to like early 90s, mid 90s, like Halloween, Gamma Ray, um, Rhapsody and all those guys and Angra, of course, from Brazil. And they integrated the symphonic elements so like so naturally. And I've always loved that sound, like this big epic orchestra plus band stuff. So like you, you got to listen to those things and just kind of find out like what works and yeah, I think that's a great start. And you don't need a formal education to do this. You you don't. Yeah, this, this is great. Yeah. And uh, we we are uh, for uh, actually just a fun fact, because I think it's very, very uh, fresh to talk about that. Shota and I, we worked on Felipe Andreoli's some arrangements for some of his tracks for, for, for on his solo album, Felipe Andreoli, the bass player on Ang of Angra. And we are working on uh, Graham Bonnet's uh, uh, next album as well. So it's um, this rock plus orchestra is, is a pretty cool thing uh, to, to work on it. And uh, yeah, and yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing. I'm, I had, just had a brain fart here. Yeah, you're losing your mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my uh, Evander Campos said this art about the Sonic. Uh, this orchestra was wonderful. Uh, the, oh yeah, they all did the okay. Yeah, I did the arrangement for Sonic Two and Sonic Game Gears. It was super cool. And I think there is a very good ask question here that it's like I think you and I we can talk about it that shoulda because um, Joe is asking how different it is to work with real orchestra from working with, uh, you know, virtual instruments. Okay, yes, I, I would love to talk about this actually. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know. You're like, so he has, do you often run into intonation or timing issues? Is editing as necessary as is it when recording events? So let's just be clear, we are not talking about any specific project here, right? We're gonna be talking about overall experience. <laughs> no, like this is a generic question, but like, yes. you know, um, first of all, machines are uh, machines. And you, you do have to realize this when you sequence it, let's say like you buy like the, the best of the best orchestra sample libraries and they sound great, but it, 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 it doesn't sound like that in, in live setting and you're working with humans and there will be some errors, mistakes and stuff. But uh, to me, imperfection is perfection. If, if it sounds too perfect, it just sounds weird to me yeah. and panning and all that stuff. It's just like, it gets it gets a little weird, you know. Like when you hear the, I wouldn't, I don't want to call it fake orchestra, but like it's it's a great tool for for composers to be able to bring out their inner musical intention. So I think it's a tool, and you do have to consider VSD libraries as tools. You should never ever consider them as like a, the real live thing because just like i've seen too many examples when composers wrote things and then like they hand me over hey can we can we arrange this for live orchestras and stuff and it nothing's playable because it, you know it's it's not the same so i, I do suggest working with live musicians because it's just it's far more productive and far more important. And uh, you, you can buy the best of best sample library, but it cannot defeat one single amazing player. You will never, and until, you know, maybe 50 years from now or like 20 years from now, it just, it can never, never beat a good player or good ensemble. And you would sit in front of a desk for like, 10 hours to trying to make it sound right when you can record a full orchestra for five minutes 
and they sound like incredibly well and that's that's how how it is so you you should always aim for recording like live orchestras when you can and the timing is is very different too like you can you can trim trim timings like and however you want with samples but it's not like that so you do have to consider those things when you write for an, a real orchestra but that's the fun part right like yeah. I, I just love working with people i don't i don't like working with machines and it's it, it's great it's a, it's a tool but like it just only gets me so far with the creativity and stuff i, I just i just love like how collaboration can make your music better and that can only happen with people yeah this is a great answer man yes and you know like uh, i i i on top i i agree 100 with each other say i uh my very first uh ex musical experience was by playing tuba on a local orchestra in sao paulo when i was 12. that's how i i was first uh, connected to to orchestra music and i played there for four years and then i jumped into the guitar uh, at that time, I was learning musical, uh, classical music, etc. But for a while, it's it's interesting. Like a, a lot of this knowledge got lost because of the modern world where we just based composing on MIDI and it's stuff like that. And you kind of you start to forget some of this stuff, some of the 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 rules and techniques that makes a real orchestra work and as a real orchestra. Because right, Shota is not just about making the best melody ever in the best chord progression ever and it's all about making work well on the orchestra like it's a very effective way like recently we work with um on a project i'm not gonna say the name but there was a, a, a <laughs> there, there was a japanese orchestrator uh you know who i'm talking about right yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so she i remember like when i was checking her uh her orchestra orchestration i, I was i was doing the mock-up i it was like a masterpiece it was like perfection. I mean, I remember like I I text Shot. I say, dude, this person is fantastic. Oh my god! And uh, so the, the the thing is like when you just compose for our virtual instruments, it, it's a whole different knowledge than composing a range for a live orchestra. So people need to be aware of that. Uh, it's yeah. that's why like even though if you write amazingly well with sample libraries, that doesn't mean you will write amazingly well for live orchestra. That's why it's so important to have an orchestrator. Yeah. yeah. And also, like, I always think about this, you know, like, what if something happens and uh, we lose electricity? <laughs> then, like, <laughs> yes. then, if you can't write actual music, like, if you can't, I shouldn't say actual music, but if, if you can't write, uh, like, notes, if you can notate stuff, then like nobody you can't do anything then yeah then you lose everything and so like i i always i do respect the people who who, who come up with the great music with sequencing like that's that's not my point but um i do have a huge respect for them because like they are great at them coming up with awesome melodies but uh, in the end somebody has to play your music so you uh, you should always try to work with my musicians and uh, just understand how they function, how they un how they hear things, how they interpret your music, how they play, um, and so on and so forth. I think that will only benefit you, and frankly, um, I think that will make your sequencing even better, even because you you know how it should sound. Yes, mm -hmm. perfect. So there is a, a technical question here. I wish Falk was here, man. <laughs> oh, I should have asked him to come. So there's a how how you decide how many players make choices, techniques. I don't know what Mimi means by techniques, but yeah, how, but how, well, how, I mean how size. it's a how many players. So the first thing, the budget kind of dictates your decision, right? But also you you do have to pitch the client that, like, hey, in order to um kind of like replicate what you what you are doing with this sequencing you do need this like this size and so i would usually say hey um your your music sounds like really big so then like you need more players and like i just give certain formats 
And if they agree to it, and then just we go with that. So it's it, it's about the sound. I, you kind of like once you start working with live orchestras, you kind of get used to um, figuring out how many people, how many players you would need for yeah. certain sounds. So that, that that can only come with experience, I think, because beginning like nobody knew, like I, yeah. I didn't know. And uh, yeah, like once you start working with with a live ensemble, then you uh, find out. Oh man, like quartet will not sound great for this piece, and maybe I need like sixteen players, twenty players, forty players, and also like you write differently for each uh, format. So that's something you have to consider. And Mike's choices, like it's usually up to the the recording engineers um, at the studio, and uh, unless unless you have a very specific choice, and most of those productions that we talked about. Uh, like Eastern European productions or like the, the the ones in the US, they they have great recording engineers and great equipment already. So a lot of times we just leave it to them, but we do get the the map of miking and also the the mic model just in case we find something. So yeah, and uh, techniques. I I don't know what te- techniques you're talking about, but hall size. Hall size, um, again, like that depends on like what you want to do. Like if you want to record everybody at the same time, obviously like the hall has to be big enough. And uh, also the, there are the specific sounds that you can get from hall recording. So that's something you can consider. And if you don't really, if you're adding reverb and stuff later on, on by yourself, then you can just choose like a drier room and so on and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's all music. Everything's like a musical intention. So someone uh, sent compliments to the, the your singer because uh, was at the BGS and said your singer is, is <laughs> was amazing. Thank you. Uh, and uh, okay, so so we have uh, okay, Andrea Abi Saber. It is possible to have adaptive music. Uh, with a live orchestra, uh, yes, it is. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I think then you record you intentionally, deliberately you record yeah. sections by section, and yeah. uh, so like you, you record just the string section, and also like you you record the layer separately as well, and then you record woodwinds, brass, percussion, like all of the elements separately, so that you can like play around later on. You can chop them or like do however whatever you want to do to kind of like you know make it adaptive but it will sound better than sequencing for sure yeah and it, you know it's it's I, I think it's very important to high, also say that when you work on a live orchestra for a game that will have interactive audio preparation in terms of how the dynamic music system will work prior to the recording even prior to composing the music pieces is mandatory Otherwise, you're gonna lose everything. There is, a, I think, that one of my favorite games, the modern games that works with live orchestra and dynamic music, is a game developed by Capcom called Remember Me, which I, it wasn't very successful as far as I know. But the composer uh, Olivier Olivier, he did such a great job with live orchestra and twisting all the sounds and and and, and changing dynamically. It's Olivier Olivier is like one of the Possibly when I think about interactive game audio, nowadays, Olivier Delivier for me is the man. Like uh, he is, his mindset is completely oriented into dynamic interactive audio. So, uh, and there are some interviews with him about it, talking about that is pretty, pretty cool, he recommended. Um, Tim Rescala is here. Oh, hi, Tim. What a pleasure to have you here, man. Now I'm so happy to know that you're here at the end of the panel because if it was in the beginning, I would be super nervous. <laughs> uh, so Tim said, yeah, it's true. Like, yeah, it's very, no, it's not the same thing composing for virtual instruments and live orchestra, even though you can share some similarities. Uh, guys, we are coming to the end. Uh, I'm going to share my screen once again so you guys can have our contacts so uh, this is Chora man this is a dark picture I'm sorry so Chora is here I swear to you guys and I am here I swear to you so this is uh, soundtracks 
uh, website. This is Shura's website. You can please send him a lot of email. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Every question yeah, you yeah, have, here it comes. <laughs> If you want to subscribe, I'm just kidding. And uh, so uh, Video Game Orchestra, the, the biggest co orchestra concert, this is the website as well. Uh, this is my website, antoniotiori.com. Uh, this is my email, uh, Andromeda Sound, my company, and the Amazonic, uh, which uh, also Chora is with me. We are, Chora and I, we are, oh, it's almost like a, a, a bro marriage here. Uh, so <laughs> the <marriage>. Amazonic. <laughs> theamazonic.com so you can uh you know check our uh, amazonian sounds there is this whole uh very cool thing connected to it where a, a big percentage of the profits is donated and sent back to people uh uh in the amazon and the library is on amazon i must say it's it's uh, it's, it's really good so yeah so soundtrack.com video-online.com this is our contact this is our website uh i don't know if you should if you have if you want to say something to wrap up uh well there there was one thing i want one more question i wanted to answer there's uh one oh, who asked me about the the how do you feel about the classical seating for strings when recording modern soundtracks oh. um yeah so up to you is you can change and uh they, i've seen people who had the bass in the center and uh they have done like the traditional classical setting or like modern a little bit modern classical setting like cello on the right or like you know viola on the right or oh, sorry the second violin on the right or something and then um yeah like you can experiment um it, there's there's no right or wrong um music theory is a consequence of music it, it's not like music theory doesn't come first it's 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 merely a consequence so like don't don't get hold back by uh by theory and uh rules and any of those things and yes it's important to learn them but in the end it, if it's your music then you should experiment so yes but anyway well thank you so much for inviting us and this was a pleasure talking and conversing and uh, interacting with all of you answering some questions and uh, yeah please check out our stuff and if you have any questions just hit us up on social media or something yeah. because we all have twitter facebook and all kinds of channels uh, just like everybody else nowadays so yeah um yeah we totally got it yeah thanks so much you guys thank you Muse Imaging. you guys were great congratulations again on putting this amazing event together for those who want to work with game audio Go for it. Never give up. It's possible. And thank you so much. Take care. Great Sunday to everyone. And you guys have today a torpedo in John Ottman. Don't forget that. Oh, my God. I'm going to definitely watch that one. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.